together. And now this is my surrender. This is my this is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. That's our prayer this morning, God. This is our surrender. God, if we prayed or we sang that, help us to get the revelation. You are all I'm chasing now. It's not part of what I'm chasing. It's not a little bit of what I'm chasing. You are all I'm chasing now. God, we so desperately need you more than we know. Help us to know. Help us to realize that this morning. Here in this awesome time of worship with you in your presence where we feel your love, your peace, your joy, your hope. And not through failure. God, help us to realize it in those moments too. You're all we need. You're all we want to chase in this life. I'm reminded of Matthew 6, 33. If we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, then everything else is added. All these things will be added unto you. So God, we put you first this morning. We chase after you. We chase after what you want for us. That's our prayer this morning, God. Would you change us, mold us, and make us to the image of your son, Jesus, as we hear your word preached as we hear it taught. May, we, may our ears just hear, but also allow it to sink into our hearts and change us, and not just for us, so that we can be those change agents for you, impact makers for you in this community. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for what you're going to do today. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. You guys are awesome. Thank you for singing. You can be seated. Well, good morning. Is this on? I can't tell. I can't thank you. I appreciate that. You're killing me back here. All right. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Terry Gibson. And uh, again, when you see me show up, you have gotten the bottom of the barrel. There is no one worse on the teaching team than I. Uh, Brian and Joe allow me to join them. Um, each week, and I cherish that time together. But for the record, I am the weak link, and I don't deny that in any way, shape, or form. So please do not judge this church based on my performance today. Come back next week. The professionals will return. I just want to say that. Um, Joe is off this week. Brian has had an incredible tough two or three weeks here. I think he's been working just ridiculous hours. And so, um, yeah, you, you get me. And for that, I, I apologize. So for the last last while, right, since almost the, the beginning of the year, we've been talking about two basic things. We've been talking about spiritual disciplines. Remember that? Remember prayer and all those things? We're talking about prayer and having margin in your life and daily Bible reading. Remember, we were going through those things, kind of establishing the fundamental foundational principles of, of kind of being a, a Christian and a believer. And then we went into this anatomy of a disciple most recently, looking at Peter's life and how Peter's just, he's not a perfect guy, but he made him the rock, you know, because he followed Jesus and he was true to him. And that's sort of where we are. And so it kind of culminates today as, as Joe last week, if you were here, you kept hearing me say, well, Terry's going to talk about that. Well, Terry's going to talk about that. Well, Terry's going to talk. Well, for the record, Brian, I probably got enough material to preach four sermons up here this morning, right? And just, I pray you don't need to be home for two, but that's okay. We'll get through this um, because really there is a lot of material, but, but I want to ask a question. So in all this that we've been doing, who in here right now, by a show of hands, show me who feels like you are now a disciple maker. Raise your hand. Come on. We've done all this work. We've talked about it all this time, and this is what we get. Did you see this? This is your failure. I don't preach. Just for the record. Um, all right. Let me ask you another question. Maybe I can get some hands up on this one, okay? How many of you have children? 
All right. Oh, that's good. That's a lot. All right. For those of you that didn't raise your hand, how many of you know a child? Okay. Raise, if you know a child, raise your hand. How many of you were a child? All right. There we go. So everybody at least just has some familiarity with this. How many of you are married to a child? All right. There, okay. See, now I did that because Brian's going to be teaching a marriage counseling class. Um, no. Uh, so no, I have two children. And, um, and I tell you this because it, it, it kind of leads into what we're talking about today. So 35 years ago or so, my wife and I moved to Fuqua Verena. And, uh, and after having lived here for a short period of time, we, we had our son. And our son was about three years old. We had a, a wonderful woman over here in town that kept him in her home. Uh, we both had to work. And so he was about three years old. And, and we were just blessed to have such a, a loving person take care of him for, for several years. But he was the only little boy that stayed there. It was him and I think it was like two or three little girls that stayed there. And you had to see her little house. It was really nice. She had her chair and my son, Benjamin, would play with his trucks and stuff right beside the chair. And then all the little girls would kind of play over there in the corner. Well, one day they were playing telephone. Yes, I'm telling the story. <laughs> my wife doesn't know this. So they're playing telephone. Um, I show up at the door to pick him up that afternoon. Mama Jean, as we called her, meets me at the door and has this really serious look at me. Terry, I need to talk to you about Benjamin. I'm like, my gosh, he's three. What has he done? What could he have possibly, he's three, right? Well, today the little girls were playing telephone. Ring, 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 somebody get the phone. Ring, 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 somebody get the phone. And this went on and on and on and on and on and on. Ring, ring, somebody get the phone. Ring, ring, somebody get the phone. Now my son is playing with his little trucks beside the chair. When he decides to stand up and say, will somebody please get the bleep phone? <laughs> Mama Jean gives me this really accusing look. Now, I know you and Glenda don't use that language around your house. And I'm going, no, we don't. But I know who does. He spent last week with his granddaddy. <laughs> yeah, for the record, it was Glenda's parents. <laughs> Not mine. It's a true story. And I'm telling you, Another thing, for those of you that aren't married yet, be careful marrying into Eastern North Carolina. You don't know what you're going to get into. So, but the point is, I mean, how many of you have ever experienced this thing where, where you see a child imitating you, right? Right? How do they learn to walk? How do they learn to eat? How do they learn to talk? The things they say, right? The mannerisms. You just saw Jackson up here. If that's not a little Joe Monk, come on. Hannah, I'm sorry. You married your father-in-law, girl. I'm just saying. So the, the point is this, imitation is a major way in which we learn. Imitation is something that kind of drives the way we, we watch and learn. I mean, we hear, yes, but we also follow and act out. How about this? You do it as adults. Did you know that? Every one of you in here has imitated another adult and you didn't have to know them. You want me to prove it to you? Everyone in this room has been somewhere you've never been before. And you walk up and you kind of watch and trying to figure out what is the process. Maybe it's a restaurant. Maybe it's some place you're going to go jury duty. You're not sure where to go. So what do you do? You look for the guy or the woman who is walking with purpose and looks like they know exactly what they're doing. And you know what you do? You follow them and you do what they do, right? Who's done it? Come on. You know you've been there. Everybody in this room's done it. And I'm going to tell you the, the reason I know this is I've done it for one thing. But just watch people sometimes. And when they're really confused, they don't know where they are. They're, they're looking for people they don't even know. And if you look like you know what you're doing, they'll trust you long enough to follow you. And they'll imitate you through that. Imitation is a major way of learning. Anybody, you younger guys, ever seen a social media influencer? Do you know what these people are? Social media influencers are simply trying to get you to imitate them, to follow them, to do what they want you to do. It's all about we are following somebody and we're leading somebody at all times. I'll say it again. Everybody in this room is a leader. Everybody in this room is a leader. Question is, are you being intentional about it or not? Right? I promise you, my son's granddad did not intentionally have him say those words. He was unintentional about his leadership and he led them the wrong way. But everyone's a leader, right? Right? Last week, Joe threw a definition of discipleship. I think we have it, um, if we can throw it up there. 
There it is. I modified it a little bit because I didn't like his definition, but I, it, not much, not much. I, I just added maker in there, disciple maker. But here's the definition of a disciple. And I just want to get back to why is Terry talking about leadership? Well, discipleship is leadership. Watch this. A disciple was someone who followed a teacher. All right, by definition, if it can follow you, you can lead it. In fact, by definition, if, you, if it follows you, you lead it. All right? I'm tired of hearing companies call managers, managers. We manage things. We lead people, okay? You manage budgets. You manage the number of people. You manage compliments. You manage all types of things, but you don't manage a human. You lead a human. If it can follow you, you lead it. So quit calling it manage. It's not manage, right? It's leadership. Okay, so here we see that. A disciple is someone who followed a teacher with the intent of becoming like him. A disciple follows a teacher to learn from him, observe how he lives, and then learn to live like him. Being a disciple maker is more than something you do. I want you to stop right there and listen to that. Being a disciple maker is more than something you do. It involves something you do, but it's more than that. It is who you are. Disciples make disciples because we imitate one another. And that's what we're going to be talking about today is today we're putting the rubber to the road. Today we're coming to reality. Today we're bringing the culmination of everything we've talked about. And we're saying now that we've studied all these things, we're going to package them together. And today we're going to show you a very simple message. Being a disciple maker is not hard. It is not hard. Quit making it something it's not. Okay. That's really what we're going to get at today. So here's our big idea. Everyone can make disciples by living authentically before Jesus daily. Okay, everyone can make disciples by living authentically before Jesus daily. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for this morning. Lord, I pray right now you will take me out of the way. Lord, let uh, I pray you will just shine through. We sit here waiting for your word. We pray you'll use this time to teach us. Lord, change us. Help us not just to have a head change, but Lord, give us a heart change. Help us to act out in the way you'll lead us. We pray these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. All right, so this is going to be a little different this week. It's a, this, is, this is a topical study, and I'm not real good at this. I'm not real good at this anyway, but, but we're going to do a topical. So if, if, if it gets a little squirrely, just think about what I should have said instead of what I did say, okay, and just go with that. Um, so here's the thing. The Apostle Paul, this imitation thing is such a big part of learning. Apostle Paul says it over and over and over again in Scripture. Now, we're going to go through a lot of Scripture really fast, and I'm going to show you where Paul continuously says, imitate me, imitate me, imitate me, imitate me, imitate me as I follow Christ. You want me to hear you say that again? Imitate me as I follow Christ. This is the art of disciple-making. Okay, being worthy of being followed. So a couple of things that we did here as well is we looked at three requirements to be imitated. And so I've kind of woven those into this thing kind of to set the stage as we move forward. I hope everybody's with me here, okay? So the first requirement to be worthy of being imitated is just that. Disciple makers have to be worthy of being followed. What does that mean? They have to trust you. You have to be trustworthy. You have to be living in a way that people trust that if they follow you, that they, I'm driving him crazy walking around up here, by the way, because they tell me every time I walk, they try to follow me with the cameras. But anyway, I'm so, I'm sorry. I apologize. I'll try to stand still. Okay, so, <laughs> no. <laughs> but right, so, so here's the thing. We, you, you have to be worthy of being followed. It's a key concept of leadership. Disciple making is leadership. It is a simple concept of leadership. Leaders are not determined by the position they hold. Leaders are determined by the follower. Think about it. You don't have to be a preacher or a teacher to have someone follow you. They just have to trust you. It's not about the position. I can show you time and time again of things we call rogue leadership in business where this guy has the job, but he's a jerk. And so everybody follows that guy over there, does what they say. Whatever problem arises, they go to them. They don't go to him, right? Well, a, a, this, you just need to be worthy of being followed. So ask yourself this question. What are you willing to follow? Who are you willing to follow? What are the requirements for that individual in order for you to put your trust in them? What would it take for you? 
Abraham Lincoln made a great comment. He said, lead as you want to be led. Jesus says it this way, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? And what that means is as you lead, lead as you want to be led. Be, be that person worthy of being followed. How do we do that? The spiritual disciplines, right? <laughs> when the light just went on, Brian, they just went, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's it. No, no, that's it. We try to make this hard. This is not hard, right? You stay plugged into Christ, you will be worthy of being followed. All right, let's move, let's, uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians 4, 14 through 17. Remember, I told you, Paul continues to tell us to imitate him. 1 Corinthians says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I have become your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. He's saying, I have attained this level. I have strived to reach this level of love as a father. I care about you. I am worthy of being followed. I'm worthy of being trusted. He said, I've worked to get there. And then verse 16, I urge you then be imitators of me right? Be imitators. That is why I sent you, Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in the Word. He's saying, look to me and imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow me. I am being a disciple maker when I live a worthy life of being followed, right? Now, let's move on to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, just a little further in this book. And here's what he says, you must follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Again, everybody's trying to get to Christ, but I'm going to do it right here. I'm going to do it in front of you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to walk with you daily. This is not hard. Paul says, live out what you believe. That's what he's saying. So if someone imitates you, they will also look like Christ. Okay? It's, it, this is not hard. Okay? Second requirement to be imitated. Disciple makers are not perfect but strive to be like the one who is. Perfection is not a requirement or a prerequisite for you to be a disciple maker. You know what is? Truth, honesty, be real. Listen, people don't follow those who are perfect because it looks fake. I am a failure. My daughter can tell you, I failed her yesterday miserably. Today, I am telling you, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I did things yesterday that embarrassed me. I was broken last night. You need to know that I'm a broken person, but I'm striving to be like Jesus, but I am not him. I will let you down, but I will love you in every case, right? That's what you're looking for. Not that you've achieved the goal, but that you, as you'll know this verse, press on towards the goal. We're just trying our best. People will follow that. People will follow that. So don't put some rule on yourself being a disciple maker that says, I have to be perfect, okay? Because that's not in there, right? Let's, let's just look right here at Philippians chapter three. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Verse 17, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Again, this is not hard. Be yourself. I feel like the genie in Aladdin. Be yourself. Remember that guy? Okay, you didn't see the movie. You're killing me here. You're killing me. So, but, but seriously, be yourself. Strive to be like Jesus and live it out. Honestly, it's okay for people to see your struggles and your failures because that's where they see Christ leading in your life. When you get beyond yourself, that's when Jesus shows up. And disciple makers aren't perfect. They're striving to be like the one who is. All right, the third requirement to be worthy of being imitated. Disciple makers are intentional in how they live. We're intentional about it. It's not happenstance. It's not accident. What we are is we are obedient to God's word. We live to serve others like Christ. We live to look like Jesus. And we are intentional about doing that daily. We take up our cross daily. We walk with him daily. And we try our very best to consider him in all things through prayer and petition. 
We put our concerns on him. We, we ask for him to be involved in everything we do, right? We are what we call Christ-centered. We have a Christ-centered worldview. We take on the mind of Christ, as scripture says, right? And we are intentional about what we do. We are not unintentional like my son's grandfather who said things he shouldn't have said, who does things he shouldn't do, right? And he is imitating the wrong things. We want to be intentional and, and lead the right way. Second Thessalonians says this, for you yourselves know you ought to imitate us. Again, Paul is saying, live, walk, love people such that they can follow you in imitating your behavior because you are trying to look like Christ. He's saying, imitate us because we are not idle. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toll and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. I realize that the people I love and I care about need to see the example of me walking with Christ and I choose to be intentional about how I live so they can see it. You get it? This isn't hard. This isn't hard. We, um, when we place Christ first in our life and we seek to be obedient to his commands every day and we love people as we are commanded, then this just flows naturally. It's an intentionality thing. We see an example of, of one of Paul's most prominent disciples that we all know because two books are written to him in the Bible. His name is Timothy, right? So let's jump over to 2 Timothy real quick. I want to show you something, the depth of this, right? The depth of the intentionality, the depth of the trustworthiness, the depth of the going through life and living and seeing the depth of Paul's life as he lived reality before Timothy. He says, you, however, talking to Timothy, <coughs> excuse me, have followed my teaching, my conduct, See, he's seen how he behaves. My aim in life, he knows Paul's goals. My faith, he's seen his depth of faith in Jesus. My patience, my love, my steadfastness. He's doing all these character qualities that Timothy has been able to see Paul live out while trusting Jesus in the world, in the world that is challenging him on every side. He's imprisoned and Timothy is seeing this stuff, right? Because he's living out reality. My persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Timothy, you saw this. You saw it firsthand. As I discipled you, as I went through the struggles in my life, I brought you along. I didn't quit discipling. I didn't quit making disciple makers because my life got hard. Instead, I let you see Jesus deliver me from the hard times that I was encountering. Right? This isn't hard. This is being honest with people that you love and care about, okay? Paul shows us again in Colossians that discipleship is a lifestyle. It's not, it's not a checkbox. It's not an add-on. It's not a, I got to create more time to go do this. See, so many of us is in the room, and Joe talked about it last week, will say, I don't have time to be a disciple maker. Oh, you don't? I'm going to show you in a minute, you're already doing it. It's just, are you being intentional or not? right? So let, let's get to this real quick. Discipleship is a lifestyle. Let's jump over in, in the book of Colossians. I want to show you that Paul, while he's in prison in Rome, is absolutely discipling people. He's being a disciple maker. Colossians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. In the introduction of this letter, he's saying, Timothy is with me. Timothy is here. He is seeing me. I am living with him. I am doing life with him. Let's flip on Colossians 4, 7 through 9. And I never get this guy's name right. It's Brian's fault if I get it wrong. Tychicus, how'd I do? That, that all right? All right, yeah, he's the scholar. Anyway, he drops the hammer on us in teaching team if we mispronounce anything. <sighs> That's all right. I got one for you a little later too. Tychicus is the... <laughs> Tychicus is the dear friend who faithfully works and serves the Lord with us, and he will give you the news about me. I am sending him to cheer you up by telling you how we are getting along. Onesimus, 
the dear and faithful follower from your own group is coming with him. The two of them will tell you everything that has happened here. Now, if you remember, so Tychicus is, is this guy that Paul has there. He starts saying these things about him. Tychicus is, is not just a friend. He is a dear friend. What does it take to be a dear friend? Is somebody that you know, somebody that you care about, somebody that is more than just an acquaintance, right? And he knows him well. He trusts him enough to carry his message. He's going to bring it for me. This is an entrusted person, someone that's close to him. So we see that Paul has grown close to these disciples in his midst. Onesimus, he is the slave that is written to about with Philemon, the book of Philemon, right? So Onesimus is also there, and he mentions Onesimus, and he talks about some of their characteristics. Drop them down to Colossians 4, 12 through 14. He's got some more people there. Your own Epaphras, who serves Christ Jesus, sends his greetings. He always prays hard. I love that. He knows this man so well that he didn't just pray, that he prays hard. And if you keep looking right here, it even says he knows what he's praying for, that you may fully know what the Lord wants you to do. He's saying, I know this man so well, and we have lived and walked life together so closely. Not only do I know how he prays and that he prays hard, I know what he's praying for, probably praying together, right? Because they know the depth of these relationships. And he says, I have seen how much trouble he has gone through for you. He has witnessed him firsthand. These are people that are walking close together. And for the followers in Laodicea and Hierapolis, our dear Dr. Luke, as in the author of the book of Luke, is there, sends you his greetings, and so does Demas. Now, let me tell you about Luke. So Luke is there with Paul, being discipled with Paul as they are iron sharpening iron. We'll talk about that in just a minute, but they are absolutely working each other, loving each other. But Paul had a group of people. It wasn't just one, a group of people that he was sharing life with, sharing ministry with, and absolutely going through life together and rubbing off on them, being a disciple maker. Let me tell, talk about Demas real quick. Demas falls away. Judas fell away. Sidebar, everybody you disciple, everybody you bring into the fold, everybody you try to love, it does not mean you cannot save them. Only Jesus Christ can save them. But the reality is there may be some, don't let it get you down and don't let it make you stop. You carry on, right, as, as a disciple maker. Here's the point. Paul knew these men, held deep relationships with them as they lived life together and shared their joy and their struggles Disciple making occurs as we go through the normal course of life, living out what we believe. It is not an add on. It is not additional. It is not something hard. It is not something you have to go to school to learn how to do. Okay? So now, what are you thinking? You're thinking, gosh, this guy's been yelling at me. What in the world? I'm sorry. I get excited. I get passionate. Here's the thing you're saying, Terry, I'm not Paul. I'm not Paul. I see Stacy saying it right now. She's like, yeah, I'm not Paul. And I can hear it coming out of your mouth. You've been in my Bible study so long, I know you, right? I'm not Paul. How do I do this? How do I do this? You're turning red, Stacy, because I'm looking at you. It's okay. You say, I'm scared. And some of you in here are going, I don't even know how to start. Others of you are going, dude, that could be weird, right? All the reasons you have. So let's talk about it real quick. How do we start discipling people? Well, here's some news. You probably already are. You probably already are, okay? Let me tell you why. You may just need to work on being intentional, but every one of you has at least one friend. If anybody in here has a friend, raise your hand. I want to see if you have a friend. All right, if you have a friend. Do you talk to that friend? If you talk to that friend, raise your hand. You talk to that friend. How many of you have a job? All right, got a job? Okay, how many of you at a job have somebody that works with you at that job? Raise your hand. You talk to them? All right. Well, there's another opportunity right there, right? And we carry on. There's so many opportunities. Everyone here has friends and acquaintances you see on a regular basis that you talk with and you influence and you spend time with. So get rid of the excuses. That's my challenge to you today is get rid of the excuses. Stop it. Stop it. And realize what you're doing here. Be more intentional, though, when you're spending that time. Look, all you have to be is worthy of being followed, staying plugged into Jesus. You don't have to be perfect. Perfection is not a prerequisite. It's not a requirement. You just need to strive to be like the one who is, right? You're just on your journey, loving Jesus, trying to press on towards that goal, right? And you need to be intentional about sharing the love of Jesus with others in a practical way as they need it. 
That love can be a word. That love can be a, a pack of brownies. That love can be shown in so many different ways, whatever the need may be, right? So Brian, Joe, and I discussed sharing some examples in, in teaching team. Just wanted to kind of throw it out there because what we really want you to start considering is, my goodness, I'm already doing this. I already have these opportunities, and it takes no more time. It's going through the course of life. And if I can say it one more time, it's just living out what you believe with others. And I'm going to say a hard thing. And frankly, it's going deeper than you've gone. I'm guilty. I've been there. I've had the hard issue come up where you're talking to somebody and all of a sudden they say, well, my wife just left me. How about them bears, huh? You know? <laughs> and we do that. We avoid because we're overwhelmed. We're scared. We don't know what to say. We're not confident. We're really all they may need is a hug. I don't know what to say. I'm being honest. I don't know what to say to you right now. I don't know how to help you right now, but I want to, and I'm going to do something. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to do something, right? So that's step one is quit running from the hard things. In fact, I challenge you to go deeper and let it get hard. And we'll share some of that here in a moment. So here are some things for you to think about as opportunities for you to get more involved in disciple making, all right? I'm going to use one that, I, that, that, that really is probably my biggest blessing of the week, and it is meetings that you already have, people you meet with on a regular basis that you're already doing, all right? You're already there. Mine is the teaching team with Brian and Joe. We will get in there, and, and I'll tell you, it's, it's really a lot of fun. I've been, Brian's not been able to be with us the last several weeks. He walked in this past Tuesday, and what did I say, Brian? I am so glad you're back, because he walked in the door and hammered Joe right off the bat, <laughs> and I was loving it. Do you know it's true? Look at him. He knows it's true. I love Brian. But in there, we, we, we share hard things. We share hard times that we're going together, going through together, and we hear them. I hear the heart of these men. And we laugh, and we cut up, and we joke, and we talk about our wives. Oops. <laughs> in a good way, right? <laughs> we do. We, we, we do share some life in there while we're doing, putting our sermons together. And I promise you, we're not quoting Scripture every second right? We're not quoting scripture every second. We're not praying 24-7 when we're in there. We're living life. We're men sharing, sharing who we are. And I know I come out of there every week encouraged because I will pick something up for Brian or Joe where I see them going through something and they handle it a way. And I'm thinking, I need to make that change in my life. It is the iron sharpening iron. And, and, and I tell you, I am discipled in that moment. Joe and Brian are disciple makers for me. And I will tell you, I think in some of these groups, it is a rubbing off thing. It is, a, it is everybody in there is discipling because everybody's in a different place and having different experiences. And the Lord shows up in your life. You have something to share that they, makes you fuller, makes you better, right? So here's the deal, guys. Maybe you could go deeper in meetings you already have with relationships with people you already know. It is to add a thing to your calendar. It's just taking that moment and go on a step deeper, right? How about this? B groups. There we go, Jackson. I punched it out there. That was good, wasn't it? So B groups. If you're not in one, get in one. This is the greatest discipling opportunity we have. But I'm going to challenge you in your B groups. This is where you can serve and do life together. Make it bigger than having snacks and just reading the Bible study. Quit going in there and pretending everything's perfect. Don't put on the fake Christian persona. Go in and be real. Life is hard today. I've been working some incredible hours. I've been counseling a guy who's losing his job. Help me show him the face of Jesus. What can I learn from something you've gone through? How has Jesus delivered you? Encourage me, right? Give me good advice. And it may not be quoting a Bible verse, he may be taking God's word and applying it in a real life manner that says, dude, of all things, you have to have integrity in this situation, right? That is directly related to God's word. It's not a Bible verse, it's life. You gotta come out of this in a way that you can hold your head high no matter what the outcome, right? Stand for truth. 
It may be something that simple, but in your B groups, go deeper. Quit playing the game. It's fine to get together for an hour and everybody enjoy each other and go home and say, oh, it was fun. It was nice. It was good. Great. Go the next level. Love each other. If you need to do confidentiality agreements in your B group so nobody talks outside of there, then do it. And don't gossip in your prayer request. That's a sidebar you got for free right there. <laughs> it take, Remember, those B groups, everyone in there should be striving to be worthy of being followed, yes. right? Not perfect, but pressing towards the goal to be as good as we can and being intentional, right? Those three things. I'm going to hammer that. I hope you go out of here all afternoon going, oh, I'm being intentional. I just want you to be sick of hearing me say it because I want you to remember it. It's really, really important. How about this? Coworkers. Coworkers. Oh, and I tell you, you don't know where I work. Oh, you don't know where I worked. <laughs> oh, you can't, you can't share Jesus. I work for NCDOT. You can't share Jesus. Oh, yes, you can. You know why I can share Jesus? Because I am Jesus. He lives in me. I cannot not be Jesus. I cannot not speak Jesus, right? I cannot not be who I am. And so what I would do is I started talking about my Bible studies that we would have on Sunday nights in my house, which Stacy was one of those that was there. And we would have, what, 30 people in that room? And oh my goodness gracious, alive. The one, I got to take sidebar. I don't have enough time to tell you this. So I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, so the funniest night, I'm in there. Glenda and I travel a lot for work. We've been gone. She knows the story. We've been gone. We come back. Glenda's not there. I have another lady in the community that's helping me there. They've made cookies and all this stuff. And I have this one guy that cannot sit down. He walks and goes and walks. And he's all the time we're teaching. We're, we're dead in the middle of Bible study. And it is a great moment. Man, it's one of those few moments where you're getting ready to just say that thing that you know is going to hook them. And in the kitchen, I hear this. And I look up and milk is everywhere. And I'm just looking at him. And he says, milk's bad. <laughs> He had gone to get milk out of my refrigerator to eat with his uh, chocolate chip cookies while everybody else is in Bible study, not realizing Glenda and I had been gone for a month <laughs> and the milk was bad and he blew it all over my kitchen, right? So I go into work on Monday telling the story and my entire staff would come into my office on Monday mornings asking, hey, what happened last night at Bible study? And we would talk about our students and how much we loved them. And we would talk about the silly things that happened. And then we would talk about what we talked about. We would talk about the lesson. And it got to be a thing. And when we took a Sunday night off, they would come in on Mondays. They were disappointed when I didn't have a lesson to talk to them about to tell them what we saw or what we learned the night before. And then that moved itself into a situation where I had a young woman who was kind of on the fringes coming in there with me every Monday. She walked in one day, tears streaming down her face. She goes... This is discipleship at its hardest point. She says, Terry, my three-year-old nephew has died of cancer, and I'm so angry with God, I don't know what to do. You want to go through life with somebody hard? Try telling them that it was not God. It was sin in this world. It was our failure in the garden that brought about death, and that the real problem is not death, actually, because we all die. It's timing. Three-year-old dies, it's sad. A 90-year-old dies, oh, what a great life. The outcome is the same. Three-year-olds with Jesus. You know, and we prayed with her, and I walked with her, and I cried with her. I did. We closed the door. I don't know how many meetings I missed that morning. We cried. We went through it. And you know what? Yeah, you can't love coworkers and show Jesus in your workplace. The heck you can't. I did. Don't tell me that. You can. You just got to be willing. So you already are working with people that need to know the truth of Jesus. Bring them in in a way that just makes them comfortable. By the way, I did not walk around quoting Bible verses all day at work. Nor did I pray over everybody every second at work. I lived out life. You can do the same thing. Take advantage of it. Do it. Start small, but do it. How about this? Hobbies, recreation, sports teams, hunting clubs. Brian calls her. I pick on him, but he's sitting right here. Brian disciples men in something that he loves to do. He loves to be outdoors. He loves to hunt. He loves to fish. And so he's involved in this thing called Iron Man Outdoors, and he takes men on these trips where he serves them while they're there, takes them hunting. And when he has shared, and I'm not going to share any of these things, Brian, because it's not appropriate, but 
when he shares with Joe and I some of the things that they encounter, I'm telling you, in teaching team, we, we have a bunch of crying babies in there. Because it's real stuff that he gets into. I think one of the coolest stories he told us, I will share this, is his guys were out in their deer stands and he goes back and he wants to serve them above and beyond. And I think it was a cobbler, wasn't it? And he heated up a cobbler and took it and made sure it was hot when he got it to those guys in those stands. And their response was, man, that, that's hot. Who, who would take the time to do that? Somebody that loves you. Okay, somebody that loves you. You see, we can disciple people even doing the things you enjoy to do. What hobbies do you do right now? Do you play golf? Do you, do you like to video game? What do you do? Begin making disciples in that place. You already have the relationships, all right? How about this? Who in here eats? Raise your hand if you eat. Okay, raise your hand if you eat a lot. Okay, yes. Chris, I'm looking at you. There it is, all right. We all eat. Do it with somebody else. Invite them to your house. Go out to eat with them if your house is nasty. That's okay. <laughs> oh, come on. You don't like it when I call the truth, do you? But it's true, right? <laughs> Go out to eat with them. Glenda and I have been meeting with a couple for how many years, Glenda? Uh, four or five years at least. And they're not there yet. They know what we believe. They know we love them. They, they will, it's weird. They'll, they'll read scripture and come back and give us their interpretation of it in a weird way. <laughs> and we try to correct that as we can, but we're having to tiptoe because they're very, we're afraid they're going to run. And we're just trying to love them. But some of my, our most precious times are with these people and they will hurt your feelings very quickly, very quickly. But the reality is we are trying our best using that methodology to to disciple these people to Jesus. Now, these are lost people. And we're trying to bring them to Jesus just by having dinner with them and pouring into their life on a regular basis. And by the way, we got to get that set up because we had, it's been about a month since we've seen them. So we try to do it on a regular basis. And finally, something everybody in this room can do. Somebody, everybody in this room can do. Mark, I told you I'm going late today. What are you doing here? Just hang on. Everybody in this room knows something that somebody else in the room doesn't know. Maybe, maybe you're like me and you're just old and you have grandchildren. And now there are young people here that are going through the process of having children and raising children and are dealing with that difficulty. How about grabbing them and mentoring them? How about pouring into them your life experience? There are people in here that are good mechanics. There are people in here that are good with IT, good with technical issues. There's all types of opportunity. We have all types of great advice in here from career advice, marriage advice, financial advice, technical advice, construction advice, simply navigating life advice. Pick somebody and begin to pour into them around those topics. Tell them what you know. Lead them. For me, I happened to lead, a, 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 in my past life, before I retired, I, I led a very large organization with an awful lot of people. That enabled me the opportunity to have a lot of leadership training, this experiential mess where they take you out in the woods and blindfold you and make you go two miles blindfolded to find a stuffed bear in a tree. I'll tell you about that sometime. <laughs> we actually did that to the students one time on uh, when we did the island thing, if you remember. Uh, anyway, so, yeah, it's nuts, but you know what you learn in all of that? What you learn in all those classes, by the way, I've been through the whole Covey training too. Yes, he's Mormon. I did the whole Coven training too. And here's the bottom line. Any leadership training worth its salt is based in the word of God. Jesus Christ was the greatest leader of all time. There is absolutely not one thing you will find in any leadership research anyway. Barry Posner out of Santa Barbara, California, the, one of the better researchers in the country. Everything he's found to be true is because it is based in scripture. He just don't know it. They all think they've discovered something. But if you look in here, you know what it boils down to? Be worthy of being followed. Be real, be honest, be truthful. Love your people. Serve your people, right? You'll work for that. You will work for that. In fact, you will walk through fire for that. I'll just say this. Jesus took 12 men 2,000 years later. He's worldwide. He didn't work for three years. I just want to be clear right? There is no greater leader model. There is none nowhere better than Jesus. And so that's what I found. And so as I, 
as I take my time to share these leadership experiences with people, I have eight people I'm working with right now, okay? Eight people, and they are all very different. I have a German who married a girl from France and lives in South London. Yeah, he speaks five languages. And by the way, he is a believer and a devout believer. And if you've ever, anybody here German? Anybody German? If you've ever worked with a German, technically, let me tell you something. There is no doubt in those guys. He is a, hey, huh, you know, he'll boof, take you down. All right, I, I have a... I have a lady, I have a lady from Turkey who lives in New Jersey. You want to guess that she's not a Christian? She's not a Christian. Not a Christian. In fact, she sent me something the other day, some amulets or something scared me when I got them. Glenda came in my office and says, what is that? I go, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what they are. But we love her and she knows, she knows who I know and she knows what I believe, right? But we work with her as, as we go through this. I've got a girl who lives in Canada, uh, who now lives in Orla, Oregon, Portland, need I say more? Um, yeah, uh, and I've got, this is my favorite one. I got a guy from Spain. He's from Madrid. He lives in Scotland. You ever heard a Scottish Spanish accent? <laughs> this Southern boy has to slow people down. Hang on, Ralph. What'd you just say? You call me Ralph? Yeah. All right, anyway. So, yeah, so I've got this guy. And again, he is Catholic. He has a Catholic background. How do I know this? I spend time with him. I know them because I spend time with them. And, and I've got some, a guy from Charlotte and a guy from Eastern North Carolina, and then I've got one from the Northeast, and, and I've got one from Alabama. And I want to tell you about this one real quick. I haven't slept in a couple of weeks because of this one in Alabama. He's a leader of a large group of people. He has a very big responsibility. And, and you know what the problem he's got right now is um, there's a new CEO in his company, and they're being absolutely cruel. I don't mean mean. I mean cruel for no reason. And this guy's losing his job. He has a daughter at Ole Miss. He has a son in high school. And he is distraught because he's done nothing wrong. From a financial perspective, his numbers are ridiculously good. And we constantly talk about how you walk through this and leave with your head held high, with high character, high integrity. And he tells me all the time, Terry, I know God has a better plan. He's scared. All he needs is somebody to put their arms around him and walk through it with him. He was texting me last night. I've been on the phone with this man four or five hours a day. It's part of the job I do with the company I work for now. And we just, it breaks my heart. But guys, there are people that need you to speak into their lives and be the disciple maker, to rub them iron sharp in your mind, to remind them that Jesus has not left the throne. He is there. And sometimes they just need to see it in reality. I shared a similar experience. I was ousted in North Carolina by a guy that wound up getting fired for doing some things in the car he shouldn't have done. The guy was bad. He was, he was an issue. I hold no, no grudges there. It actually was a great thing. But my ability to share that with him has brought him to the next step. Sometimes we just have to be honest and real and live life together and share our experiences, Right. Wow, I've, I've, I'm going really long, and, I'm, and Mark's stressing out back there. And so I'm, when he does that, that real wrinkle comes on top of his bald head, and that worries me. Um, all disciple-making is is this. It's loving people, sharing life, and allowing Jesus to be the center of your life, right? And loving people and letting Jesus, I'm going to say it again, be the center of your life. It's not hard. If you love them, you'll make time. You hear me? If you love them, you will seek them out. That's just truth, guys. So just before I close, I want you to hear me, and I, I want to just kind of bring this, bring this to a little conclusion here. I want, I want to talk about what discipleship isn't. We've talked a lot about what it is, but I want, I want to be real clear about what it isn't, okay? It is not preaching at people. Discipleship is not preaching at people. It is not. It is not forcing them to pray with you 24-7. It is not. It is not some fake form of perfect religion to make them think highly of you, there's no ego in this. It's all about love. It's not thee, thy, thou, or being a holy roller. It's not about having all the answers. It is about knowing the one who does. Right? You hear me? Every conversation does not need to begin and end in a Bible verse or some deep theological thought. Because if you're living with Christ as your basis, it's going to be throughout everything you say. Your words are going to be anointed by Jesus just because he lives in you and you let, and you stay plugged into him.
Okay, you hear me? So what it is, it's living life and loving others as you seek to be more like Jesus. It's following your spiritual disciplines. It's about, it's about just, frankly, living life and being intentional as you do it. Now, I'm going to ask you a question again. How many of you feel like that you can be a disciple maker? All right, because now I'm going to hit you with the hard one. I want to remind you of what Christ says in Matthew 28. Matthew 28, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the, end of the age. I want to be clear. Christ says, go make disciples. He says, teach them. Paul says, teach them by allowing them to imitate you. Be worthy of being followed. You're putting it all together now? This is not hard. This is real simple stuff, right? But I want to be clear about one thing in Matthew 28. You ready? Here it is. This is not a request, my friends. This is a command. See, I'm the low guy on the totem pole on the preaching team. You didn't hire me, so you can't fire me, so I'm just going to tell it to you like it is today. Are you ready? <laughs> Here it is. You got two choices. Are you going to be obedient to your God, your Creator, and your Savior and go make disciples? Or are you going to tell him he isn't important enough for you to follow his commands? It's a choice you got to make. And that's the choice you're making, whether you like to look at it that way or not. That's the choice you're making. Brian is crawling under his chair. Terry, I can't believe you said that. I'm telling you. That's reality. It's you will obey or you will not. There is no gray area. Okay? Sure decision. We've shown you just how easy it is to get started. So what are you waiting on? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for this day and for, for this time. Lord, we pray that you'll move an army to begin to love the people around us in a way that we can have iron sharpening iron, where your face will come through. Lord, where, where we will see you moving in our community, where we will see changes made with the people that we already know, the people you've already placed in our lives. You've done the hard work, Lord. You've done the hard work. You've put the people in our lives. Lord, just give us the courage to step out and be intentional, to be worthy of being followed. Father, we thank you and praise you for what you're going to do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, here at the gathering, we take communion every Sunday. We just ask you to do it in a worthy manner. Take the time to, to confess your sins before him, and we would... Uh, offer this opportunity for you to come and move around and, and pick these up and the band is going to come and play. Thank you.